Hey, Gabby, did you like the script? Yeah. Written long before the deadline. <laughs> Actually, I sent that script in. It was like seven minutes after 12. We're, we're, writers, you know, are, an un, are unlovely creatures under direct. We're, we're no day at the beach uh, under the best of circumstances. But uh, hi, Bernadette. Is that Bernadette? Hi. Um, but, uh, you know, now I'm thinking these miserable bastards. Uh, it's going to be a grievance. I'm seven minutes late. And uh, I'll probably be brought up on charges. Um, and uh, that's kind of an index, I think, of uh, our predisposition to uh, project uh, into the other whether the, the other is uh, our ostensible uh, leadership uh, in the union or the bosses, uh, a malice and a kind of punitive uh, uh, attitude toward us, um, which probably is at least, you know, four to five percent legitimate. Um, and, and, I, and I think. It, uh, now watch, they'll bring me up on charges for being seven minutes late. Um, but I think that uh, that's because uh, what kind of qualifies us uh, to do what, what we're doing, or certainly makes us eligible if it doesn't qualify us, um, is a certain ambivalence toward order uh, in any manifestation, um, somehow uh, the the, uh, the the doubleness. Now, see, that's an ostentatious placement back there. Is that Scott? That's passive aggressive, Scott. Come up here. Come up here. You have to watch what. Why? What's it going to do? Walk away? Damn you. <laughs> See, Scott works for me, and, this, and it's typical of, of writers that once they get into authority, they're the most miserable, critical, uh, and, and uh, so, so uh, what I started to say, and it's probably uh, two parts, two sides of the same coin, that um, what uh, makes you eligible to be an artist of any kind is uh, an experience of the structures of order, uh, which for one reason or another predisposes you not to accept them as a given. Or if accepting them as a given, to project into them a, a, an authority over us uh, of which we disapprove, and which we feel uh, justifies us in postulating an alternative order. Um, and uh, sometimes that alternative can be a country of the imagination. Sometimes, uh, you know, when I graduated from college, I. Uh, uh, it was the time of the Vietnam Troubles, and uh, I had gotten a teaching fellowship at the Writers' Workshop in Iowa, so I was out there. And uh, it was, I, I was, uh, they had a very nice place for me to live as part of the fellowship. Uh, the guy whose house it was, I, I had a basement apartment down there. He was a puppeteer this guy, as well as a, a, so he taught classical literature or something. And uh, I was drinking pretty good. I was also doing research in other areas. And uh, periodically, I would come upon his puppets. And it would fuck me up. 
And in fact, in, in, uh, uh, by way of validating this thing about, uh, hey, Danny, uh, uh, you know, projecting into whatever the source of order is, you know, uh, having a kind of malicious uh, uh, a, a predisposition to, to posit them as, as not out for your own good. You know, I say, sure, he's putting the puppets there to drive me a little fucking nuts. This guy, uh, Dr. Arnott, I just remembered his name. So, uh, you know, at, uh, at, at college, uh, the, the thing about being a writer, uh, I am of an age, uh, where the whole idea about being a writer was how well did you hold your liquor and write. The, uh, it was a given that you were supposed to be drunk. Uh, because Hemingway was a drunk, Faulkner was a drunk, Fitzgerald was a drunk, all my teachers were drunks, uh, Richard Yates, big drunk, uh, Kurt Vonnegut, <laughs> tremendous, tremendous consumer of cannabis. And uh, uh, and I was an alcoholic anyway. So... Uh, you know, uh, now my, my, the order that I was given could not have been more benign. I had to teach a course twice a week, uh, and it was uh, Iowa at that time, uh, they weren't that good in, fo in football, a great basketball team. Downtown Freddie Brown, John Johnson. Oh, really? Uh, uh, they both had very good professional careers. But the point was, uh, part of my job was to teach these guys. And the way that the department uh, made sure that you understood that these were uh, seen, uh, these, these uh, athletes were, were not to be uh, judged too harshly was you got an additional 10 bucks an hour for everyone of these guys that you tutored, and you could tutor as many of them simultaneously as you could find. So that, you know, that's like 120 bucks an hour, right? Believe me, those guys did well. Uh, so in terms of the benignity of the circumstance, uh, the puppets notwithstanding, you know, so I had a place to live, I was making a good buck, uh, I had sold a novel, uh, the downside there was I had sold it to a number of different publishers, so that, uh, uh, and of course that bespeaks again a certain ambivalence toward the contract, the whole concept of contracts, which is one form of order. And uh, plus, I was shit faced all the time, and uh, it got very quickly to where uh, I ne I never got home. I went six months. I never got back to that apartment. Uh, and, uh, you know, while the weather was good, I'd, you know, I'd sleep in the streets. You know, I'd sleep in the, uh, it was a small town, Iowa City, you know. Uh, and, uh, but even so, you know, I got a little nippy. And, uh, you know, you'd find occasion, I wonder if I have a drinking problem. No. Uh, so, and then, and then in the winter, uh, I would stay at this place, uh, it was a, a very inexpensive place, the Hotel Jefferson, and like, I don't know, three bucks a night or something. And there was this one-armed elevator guy, uh, and he was fucked up on something. Uh, and I would, the way the bars worked, the, the regular bars closed at 11, and then there, there were places that served beer and that didn't care if you, if you smoked reefer inside until 2. So this place, Little Bill's. Is, so I would take the, I couldn't drink beer, but I, I you know, I, uh, actually, I, I was not a good consumer of reefer, but any port in a storm, as the sailors tell us. So, so then at that point, you know, I'd make my way to the Hotel Jefferson. And, and then, inexplicably, I would conceive an overwhelming desire for candy. So, 
and the, the, the elevator operator was, was this one-armed guy, and he was also the elevator, uh, he, he was the night watchman, and he was the elevator operator. And I felt the need to explain to him why each time, I, it, it wasn't enough that I would explain to him, oh, I have this massive desire for candy. I had to conceal my, my felt sense that he might find out that I was a drunk and a fucking tea head. I'd just buy the candy one bar at a time. And then I would find a pretext to go back. I said, look, can you hang on for one more second? This is crazy. I wanted the Clark bar, but I also wanted a Zag nut. <laughs> now I go back to it and I say, do they have three musketeers? He says, just get in or off the elevator. So, which is to say that we project into now, this elevator operator was not an apostle of order, uh, except the fact that he operated the elevator. But, and I had to sign, but I mean, after a while, I mean, he knew it was me. Uh, but I was projecting into him a, a, an ability to judge me, you know. And uh, in this, on the other hand, I couldn't get back to the apartment. So if I was really that concerned about appearances, you know, I, I mean, here I am sleeping in the streets, but then I'm trying to explain to the elevator operator why I want my fifth Zagna. So we're kind of selective about, uh, uh, or idiosyncratic or subjective, let's say, in our sense of our relationship to whatever we identify as the ordering authorities in our life. Now I'm thinking if I should tell you this horrible story. <laughs> Once I got back to my apartment. Uh, no, I'm not going to tell you this story. <laughs> so, now nah, I'm not going to do that. But, but, but he, so here's the thing. Um, now there's a strike going on, and uh, we feel at once, I suspect, uh, generally depressed because we who have, have this very tentative and kind of provisional and ambivalent relationship to order, to the structures within which we operate, including the structures of imagination, now for reasons which we don't completely understand and probably don't fully endorse, our bridge to the world just got shut down. Um, and uh, all sorts of uh, antisocial behavior uh, occur as a possibility in response to that. Um, I like, uh, af after I lost my deferment, you know, in the Vietnam troubles, so I lost my deferment after the first year there on, at Iowa. Uh, and uh, I had a low number for the draft. I've been accepted at Yale Law School. So, uh, which is what my parents wanted me to do anyway. So I go back to Yale Law School. And, uh, but I had also been issued a credit, a credit card, a Gulf Oil credit card, on the back of which says you can stay at Holiday Inns. And again, in terms of having this imperfect understanding of what constitutes a contract, you know, what, what constitutes legal obligation, you know, oh, these idiots sent me a credit card. So I moved into the Holiday Inn. And, uh, you know, the idea that you had to pay for a credit card it just wasn't something that I understood. Uh, it's also, you know, I became a thief. But I'd like not to judge myself too harshly in that regard because, <laughs> I mean, I didn't understand the idea of property that well. Uh, if you've had your boundaries violated one way or another, you know, uh, 
Uh, so anyway, I'm in law school. I, I was on acid. I was on acid consecutively for more days than everyone in this room together has taken it from birth until today. <laughs> Trust me on this one thing. And, uh, you know, I go to school, I, I go, I, I didn't go much. You know, I went, with the guy who wrote a book called The Greening of America, evidently 40 years too early, Charles Reich was one of the teachers there. Uh, uh, President Clinton was a classmate. Hillary was a classmate. Clarence Thomas was a classmate. I didn't know this at the time because I didn't meet any of my classmates. <laughs> um, I had one friend who would trip with me as much as I did, but he weighed 270 pounds, and so he metabolized it a lot better than I did. Uh, Bobby Uptight was his name, and uh, he became, went on to become famous as the bass player, famous, in a group called uh, Root Boy Slim. Did anybody ever hear of them? No. So, but anyway, at that time, he was also in law school uh, to beat the draft. He had been drafted third by the Miami Dolphins, but that was not a draftable uh, commitment. So uh, we would be loaded all the time, and, and uh, we both had uh, motorcycles, me on a Norton 650 glued beyond recognition and on acid. We go up on East Rock, which was this big, and we would play this thing called Random Particle at night. You close your eyes, you open the bike, you know, just as far as it would go, and the first guy that opened his eyes was gay. <laughs> so he went off a cliff. Bobby went off the cliff. Um, and, and, and I will tell you how I came to leave law school, uh, which was that uh, Bobby got caught wrong by his bride. She goes back to Chicago to divorce him. And he's, and, and they had a small child, as I recall. And they say, well, what should I do? You know, I says, well, what do you want to do? He said, I don't know. I says, well, do you think you might want to save the marriage? He says, possibly. I said, well, you better get back there, right? He says, will you watch my apartment? I says, how can you even ask me that? I mean, I'm staying in the holiday. It doesn't make any difference to me. So I'm in his apartment, right? Now, uh, he's from the South. His great-grandfather, somebody was in the Civil War. So I'm going through all of this stuff, you know. And I find a Civil War sword. So I start to destroy all of his furniture, all of his clothes, you know, and everything. Uh, for no particular reason. But again, you know, the idea of order. The fuck? Now I find a shotgun. I find shotgun shells. I, I'm Jewish, but I can assemble a shotgun. <laughs> I'm out in the street with my shotgun, with my shotgun shells. Boom! Boom! I'm blowing out every goddamn street light on Whitney Avenue. And because I'm on acid, you know, I'm thinking, look at this, the gun goes off, the street light explodes. The gun goes off, the traffic light explodes. The gun goes off, the bubble gum machine on the police car keeps coming. Evidently, I missed. So I stash my shotgun under, the, under a car. I mail my shotgun shells. I go running up to the cops. I says, Jesus Christ, somebody is bullshit back there. They said, we know, we got the report, get out of the area. <laughs> so, now I'm thinking, the kid, bulletproof. So I go, you know, I go 50 feet. Now, the dramatic inadequacy of reality sets in. 
I, you dumb dago bastards, it was me. Here they come. Bing, bang, boom. So I'm arrested. And, you know, that could obviously be construed as shooting, you know. So that's how I left law school. I had to plead to a felony, which made me ineligible for the draft, which was, after all, the purpose of the exercise. <laughs> and uh, meanwhile, what happened to my novel? Well, one thing was, you know, I had sold it by this time to a couple more publishers. Uh, so that was receding as a realistic possibility. Um, and uh, my relationship with the structures of order was deteriorating. You know, uh, some of you, I'm sure, will, will be familiar with this expression. I know that I'm about to hit a bottom when my circumstances are deteriorating faster than I am able to lower my standards. <laughs> and uh, so I'm, I'm knocking around, you know, uh, I wound up in a Port Authority bus terminal, uh, and uh, it was saved probably from even more compromising behavior. Uh, this guy, I see this guy coming through in a top hat and an opera cape, and I'm looking at him. It's it's, it's Floyd. It's this guy I knew, an undergrad. We were undergraduates together. And he dropped out when he was a sophomore uh, because, uh, and he says, I'm going to become the biggest acid dealer in America. <laughs> and I said, God love you, you know, good luck. And so now it's like three or four years later. And uh, there he is in an opera cape. And, a, uh, and I, I say, Floyd, not having many alternatives. Now, uh, People who are criminals or artists or, uh, you know, uh, how many have read Crime and Punishment? You are a bunch of bald-faced liars. <laughs> anyway, there's, uh, in Crime and Punishment, you know, there's this thing where it's, it's, uh, uh, the guy trying to prove God's existence commits a murder. Uh, which is a way to say that, you know, there's, the, again, that doubleness in relation. So, so Floyd, it was very important to Floyd to prove to me that his decision to drop out of college had been proved out because this guy had, had made so much money. He's, uh, I'll tell you what he said, uh, which actually I wound up taking as a challenge. He said, I have made so much money that even you can't piss it away. Well, I had a new job, <laughs> pissing away Floyd's money. Uh, Elvis was making a comeback uh, in Las Vegas. And uh, I said, well, let's see about that project, pissing away your money, and we'll check out Elvis. So we go out there. I lost a number of hundreds of thousands of dollars before Floyd came back from having a Coke. Um, and uh, and I never got to see Elvis, but I did get to meet all of the Ikeets, Ike and Tina Turner's backup group, and they were working in the second room. And I've always believed I came out on the long end of that transaction. Um, now, we know that I turned out to be a writer, but I think it's also clear that you know, and then things got started to get bad after that, you know, and I wound up in jail in Mexico and so on. Um, now, I graduated first in my class from Yale. I sold a book as an undergraduate. Uh, I was a bit of a fair-haired boy, you know, in, in uh, Lillian Hellman and all these people, you know, uh, I was I was I was a new flavor there for uh, seven minutes. So, uh, and and yet here I was, you know, in jail in Mexico. 
ambivalence towards order. Um, and uh, that comes from, you know, having a mixed experience of order uh, when we're younger. Now, that, uh, so here we are again back, at the, back in Strike Central. I like to think that wherever I am is central. <laughs> this is the, uh, you know, the thesis that, uh, that what's called self-centered fear. I am the piece of shit at the center of the universe. Um, there is uh, a sense of panic and uh, disempowerment and desperation, which I suspect is uh, kind of percolating into the consciousness or the unconscious of a lot of writers now because the secret suspicion that we, uh, if we don't nourish it, I, I, I think at least we cohabit with it, is I am very lucky that I have had any kind of employment at all. If they ever knew what's going on in here, not only would I be unemployed, I would be institutionalized. And probably should be. Now, if that's the case, and now we are asked to go out on strike, We hate our guild leaders. Uh, or we love our guild leaders and we hate the bosses. Uh, in either case, it's the Stockholm Syndrome, where we identify with those we perceive as our captors. Because our idea of those who legislate the order in our lives is wounded and distorted. Um, if, if, uh, 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 wh when I talk to writers uh, who are more or less within the walls uh, of the city, you know, and they piss and moan about, uh, I take notes from morons all day long. And I have to do it because they're my bosses. What I hear is, I'm home. Uh, I get to do my work, and I get to resent the organizing <laughs> force in my life. Now, uh, the only uh, uh, downside with that is, and I'm writing shit. Well, uh, if that's the case, that is a form, before we're out on strike, of what we were talking about when we all sat down. That's a form of despair. Uh, if you have to say that you're writing shit, for whatever reason, you've lost the possibility that the bridge to the world of our art offered as a way back from our woundedness. Because that resentment and doubleness uh, uh, and antagonism uh, and apocalyptic re resentment of order um, the structures of art uh, offer us an alternative to. But we have to be brave enough, or something, uh, to let that participation uh, heal us. Um, but uh, people who've been abused one way or another go to the familiar. You know, you ask a, 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 a prostitute, you know, uh, I had a cousin who met one once, and, 
and part of the deal, you know, after you come. What are you doing in this line of work? The trick says, to, as a way, uh, this is how he begins to disengage and say, I'm not really. Uh, how, what are you doing here? Well, I'll tell you a funny story. Uh, I had this guy, a uh, good friend, uh, another junkie. Uh, by this time, I was a junkie. Uh, Larry, he died. He, 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 uh, Larry died sober. And, but at this point, uh, Larry was a, um, uh, had multiple opportunities. I think he was probably, uh, he was certainly a junkie. I think probably he was gay and maybe didn't want to be. And, uh, and uh, he was a compulsive gambler. And so, so, anyways, uh, and he weighed about 350 pounds. So his act was he would, uh, he couldn't hit himself. I think because he was ambivalent about being gay, so the idea of penetration was a little rough for him. <laughs> well, that's funny unless it's not funny. Uh, uh, so he would have the he would he would bring these prostitutes in, and in exchange for him giving them dope, they would hit him. You know, they they they'd shoot him up. Then he would turn on a tape recorder. And he would record himself rebuking them. I, 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 I just don't understand how you can do this to your parents. Now, the whores would get up. I don't know how I can. I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop. And he would say, well, when are you going to stop? This is soon, Larry. Thank God. So, you know, it's win-win. Um. Now, that was a digression. What were we talking about? Um, the, so, so the, the I, idea of, uh, you know, identifying with, uh, with your captors, is that what we were talking about? I think we might have moved past that. Thank you. Uh, so Larry was, uh, Larry was in despair, and... Uh, he called, he, he called, uh, by now I was working out here and he was dying. And uh, he said, you know, I'd like to try and get sober before I die. So I says, come on. Oh, I remember. what. And Dick Yates, wonderful writer. Leonardo DiCaprio is making uh, Dick's novel, fine. Revolutionary Road after all this time. A drunk. And uh, he was my teacher at Iowa. And he was out here and I was... Uh, we had this strange sort of, uh, the way he could keep his dignity was, I hired him to do a film script, which he never did. And uh, it was like uh, uh, Larry and the Whores. And then he ever, uh, we'd meet twice a month so he could uh, indict me for having sold out my talent. And uh, so Dick, by this point, was so fucked up, and I says, Larry, you're going to drive Dick around. So now both of them had a job. And actually, it was a wonderful thing to watch because Larry represented everything. You know, Dick was a working class guy who was smitten with Fitzgerald and stuff. And so Larry represented everything for which Dick had undiluted scorn. But he actually liked them a lot. Plus, Larry would smoke these horrible fucking cigars. And he'd drive Dick around, and they'd go to the movies and all this stuff, and then Larry would review the movies. Now, Dick was a uh, guy of uh, considerable, you know, repute and accomplishment. And he would say, "How I'm, I'm listening to this guy review James Bond movies. I don't like the movies. I don't like the reviews. For the first time in years, he was happy. And Larry was happy. Larry uh, would come over to the house in the morning, and he'd make our kids rice pudding, like about six in the morning. And uh, he was so happy to be able to, you know, to meet his obligations. Uh, I'll be goddamned. Oh, so you're in despair. Uh, the, uh, uh, it, it, 
if you have arranged your life in such a way as to conceive of yourself as a victim, whether or not you're getting a paycheck, you have lost the opportunity uh, which the gift to you from God, which is your art, has offered as a way to heal and to lose your resentment of order. Um, if instead of saying, look, I got to write procedurals. It's the only thing that pays the bills, but I hate it. I want to do character stuff. As if those two things, you know, were necessarily in opposition. That's horseshit. By which I mean, you know, I, 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 I was taught uh, by people who took all my money, uh, don't listen to what people say. Watch what they do. And um, if that's what you're doing and someone doesn't have a gun to your head, that's what you want to do because we do go to the familiar. And if we have a stake in believing ourselves victimized, we pursue situations in which we can conceive of ourselves as victims. Now, what does all this have to do with the strike? Probably very little. But uh, I, uh, uh, as, as they said in some film, I know a way out of hell. Uh, which is to re-encounter the possibility of being, uh, of, of letting your art. And look, all of us have had the experience, the flickering experience of what art's possibilities are, which is for just an instant you feel whole. For just an instant, you feel part of things. And there, there's a, a wave that comes over you. And you think, I'm home. And nobody's trying to hurt me. I, am a, I have a place in the world. 